Okay, thank you, thank you very much for being here. We are pro proud to open today the third edition of Multiply 40, the literary festival that uh, brings an important uh, number of uh, Italian narrators to New York in dialogue with the translators, publishers, readers, cultural organizers, and this year also video makers. An important uh, novelty this year will be the presence of the uh, Salone del Libro di Torino, the Turin Book Fair. Uh, we thank uh, the new director of the Salone, Annalena Benini, for her availability. And we also thank the institutions that are collaborating with the Institute to the success of Multiply 40, the Italian Writers Federation, the Bridge Prize, the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimov NYU, Hunter College of CUNY, the Center for Italian Modern Art, the Rizzoli Bookstore. I would like to underline the fact that dedicating a festival to literature means dedicating it to the field of possibility. Literature speaks not only about reality, not only about what already exists, but about what could exist and come into light. Narrators are inspired by possibility in all fields, the literary, the linguistic, the social, the economic, the aesthetic, which means exactly the possible multiplication and modification of the existing world. This is uh, why the festival is called uh, Multiply 40. And I would like to quote uh, jo uh, Calvino, who said, who wrote, of course, if I choose to be an optimist, there was always uh, the possibility that uh, if our two parallels continued to infinity, the moment would come when they would touch. Special thanks to go to Maria Ida Greta, who carried out a great work of a conception, of a coordination of the festival. And uh, now we start speaking exactly about this multiplied reality, which is constituted by books. With uh, uh, the uh, New York Review of Books and l'Indice dei Libri del Mese. It's uh, a double... Uh, and anniversary because uh, it's uh, 60, 61 years for the New York uh, Review of book, uh, Books uh, and uh, 40 years for l'Indice dei Libri del Mese. And uh, we have here Lauren Kane, editor of the New York Review of Books, uh, and uh, Ria Ederman, publisher of uh, the review, and uh, Massimo Valerio Vallerani, um, editor of uh, the Indice and they will be in conversation with uh, Alain Elkan. Please welcome uh, our guests. Uh, good morning, everyone. Buongiorno a tutti. Funziona? Does it funziona? Buongiorno a tutti, good morning to everyone. Uh, I believe that uh, before we come into a discussion that uh, <coughs> our hosts will explain to the public what does it mean, what is the New York Review of Books. I mean, you all know it, what is the New York Review of Books, but uh, as there is this 60th anniversary, uh, it would be nice if uh, the publisher uh, Ray Ederman will tell us why he is the publisher of the New York Review of Books and what is the Review of Books today. We all know that the Review of Books had two very famous editors, Barbara Epstein and Robert Silvers, who sadly passed away and uh, who were the people who have created this very important institution. But uh, Ray just told me that he is there since the publisher since the 90s. Therefore, he knew what happened before and he knows what is happening today in the review. After Ray, we will ask to Massimo Valerio Valerani to explain the same thing about uh, l'indice uh, dei libri. So, 
then we will discuss with Lauren hey, what it means for her to be organizing the editors and what is her job. And then, of course, afterwards, if there are any questions, you will be able to ask whatever you wish to one of them or to all of them. Thank you. So, Ray, if you please want to tell us what is the real career group today, and what it has been, and what do you do, and why you are the publisher. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about the background of the New York Review, uh, which started in 1963. Uh, when Robert Silvers was editor of Harper's Magazine, can you hear? Okay. Now can you hear? Okay. Uh, when Robert Silvers was editor of Harper's Magazine, he was concerned about the status of book reviewing in America. So he asked uh, Elizabeth Hardwick, who's an essayist and critic, if she would write a piece for him to talk about the state of book reviewing in America. Her, what she wrote was quite fierce and very critical of, of specifically the New York Times, but book reviewing in general. Uh, some of her comments talked about the faint praise of books given by reviewers, uh, the light little article and she mentioned platitudes in book reviewing falling like leaves with nothing of substance said in the reviews themselves. At the time, Harper's Magazine was owned by a publishing company, and Bob told me later that there was a lot of pushback against him for running that article because Harper's relied a lot on advertising from book publishers. A few years later, this is not Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a few years later, during a dinner party at uh, Elizabeth Hardwick's house on West 67th Street, Elizabeth, who was married to the poet Robert Lowell, and their friends Jason Epstein, who was an editor at Random House, and Barb Epstein were having dinner, and they outlined a new publication which would become the New York Review of Books. And in 1963, there was a newspaper strike, um, which went on, I believe, for nine months. So there were no book reviews in New York coming out. And Jason said, if we're ever going to start a book review, this is the time, because publishers are print coming out with new books, and there's no place to advertise them, and we have a, a, an opportunity right now. So they put together the, the first issue, and the, the some of the contributors in that first issue were James Baldwin, Mary McCarthy, W.H. Auden, Susan Sontag, Alfred Kazin, Norman Mailer, and Gore Vidal. That first issue sold out. It was put together very quickly. The pieces, unlike the New York Review today, were all quite short. You can see the, the first issue online. Today, they're average, what, we'd say 4,000 words. Uh, for peace, those were probably 500 words in the original issue. In that first issue, there was an editorial that Bob and Barbara wrote, and the, it said, and it's the only editorial that the New York Review has ever published. And, and here's part of what that editorial said. This issue of the New York Review does not pretend to cover all the books of the season, or even all the important ones. Neither time nor space, however, have been spent on books which are trivial in their intentions or venal in their effects, except occasionally to reduce a temporarily inflated reputation or to call attention to a fraud. So from the very beginning, the idea of the review was not to, to cover all the books that were coming, or as they said in the editorial, even the most important books. It was to deal with ideas basically using books as a departure point to discuss ideas about science, politics, art, literature, the whole spectrum of culture. And the, the review continues to do that. It's been doing it now for over 60 years. The issue sold out and it was determined to continue the publication and, and Bob and Barbara were named permanent editors of the review. They both remained editors until they died. Barbara died in 2006 and Bob in 2017. 
From the first issue, the review has been independent and it continues to be. And independence was the most important part of the, um, of the review. The original stockholders of the review were friends of uh, Bob and Barbara and Robert Lowell and so on, and they include people like Brooke Astor and Walter Pincus and a variety of different people, but it was understood that they would have no editorial say in the publication at all. And in fact, some of the early contributors financially to the magazine asked for their money back because the review became so stridently anti-Vietnam that it made a lot of the original investors uncomfortable. And that's what the review has always done. It's, it's has pushed back against perceived wisdoms. It was, um, as I say, quite early on against Vietnam. It was in favor, very vocally, of civil rights. It exposed the lies of the Iran-Contra conflict. It imposed the invasion of Iraq. When George Bush was talking about invading Iraq, I remember Bob and I met, and we agreed that every issue of the New York Review would have three articles giving the facts about this run-up for the invasion of Iraq and how wrong it was and, and the lies that were being told. And we did that for, uh, must have been a year and a half before they actually started the invasion itself. Then we continued to write about it. Uh, Mark Danner exposed CIA torture centers all over the world. Um, so it's, it, it's that kind of publication and we, we hope to still do that. We're, Lauren can speak to this, writing quite a bit about the war in Gaza and the implications of that and the suffering and so on from it. The, what, we, what the review has tried to do is to have the best minds write about subjects that are important. Uh, just for example, when um, in the Vietnam War, uh, Bob and Barbara sent Mary McCarthy to Hanoi to write about uh, Vietnam. And Susan Sontag was also in Vietnam writing pieces for it. Uh, Joan Didion went to El Salvador. Uh, we have now, we've just had Tim Judah in Ukraine. So it's, we have been active in trying to not just write from books, but write from actual experience. And we're now, last thing to say basically is, we're one of the last venues for long-form journalism uh, in print, uh, in America anyway. And I think that's important that, that Bob always said we give our writers the time and the space to write what they need to say, and we continue to do that. So, so. <laughs> So I believe that uh, maybe you should say also something about uh, the organization that you're working on. Uh, the publisher was quoting uh, actually what uh, you're doing now for the Gaza war, right? So how do you organize the pieces? And then another thing that hasn't been said is that uh, we talk about books today also. So it's also the criteria, which books do you review? How do you review the books? And who's making the choices? What I know by experience is I'm an old reader. And I think that uh, Bob Silvers came from another tradition, which was the Paris Review at the beginning. Um, we would like we we know that some Italian writers like Italo Calvino or Umberto Eco or maybe Giorgio Bassani have contributed Roberto in the uh, Roberto Calasso, Roberto Calasso maybe great. Alberto Moravia and uh, uh, William Weaver, the man who has translated most of these books into English, these Italian books, right? So there is also a tradition of Italian writers who had. Publish, published articles in, in the review. So what is interesting in how, how do you make your choices, you know, not only about Gaza or Ukraine or Vietnam and all this, which are the current politics uh, at the very moment, but also which books you decide to, to, to review and why and uh, 
and who is reviewing them? Sorry, this is a large question, but maybe one of you can answer to that. Lauren, like Bob, came to Paris Review for the New York Review. Yes. I love I, the interviews, uh, writers at work. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Lauren uh, Kane. I'm the managing editor of the New York Review. Uh, I was at the Paris Review before that. I uh, So if you work in magazines, you probably know what a managing editor means. But if you don't, you probably don't. You have a foggy idea, if any. Um, but to give a short answer, uh, my job is to work closely with our editor, Emily Greenhouse, uh, on um, everything from uh, putting uh, an issue to press, which we are doing this week. We will put our art issue, annual art issue to press, which has pieces on topics as wide ranging as contemporary painting, uh, Nicole Eisenman's paintings uh, by Julian Bell, uh, Colin Bailey on the new galleries, the new galleries at the Met, the European painting galleries, which have just renovated and reorganized and opened um and uh so you can look forward to that but of course it's not just uh matters of aesthetics our next issue also has david shulman writing from israel uh on on the situation there and to to answer your first question about coverage of uh the conflict there i think uh you know to raise point the new york review of books is not just in a in a echo chamber of what's public being published uh, in New York City, um, but is engaged in foreign affairs and certainly we have an outstanding team of online editors, especially uh, our online editor Max Nelson has been a force in um, coverage and keeping us current and uh, um, thoughtful while still uh, you know um, up to date on on what. On the situation and how it's developing and i think it just always leading with with uh, to me personally what reads as real uh deep thought and deep empathy um uh always with with the pieces that we're publishing uh so um there's that that would be uh I, and to the question so uh, putting an issue to press is part of my job. We've got the art issue, and uh, another part of my job is working closely with Emily and all of our editors on uh, assigning assigning reviews and and which review to whom. Of course, we've got uh, we've we've always we've never had staff writers. We uh, we all of our writers are contributors, and. Uh, that means that we have a great deal of breadth and flexibility with the people that we can uh, have write for us. Uh, but then there are a stable of writers that we have wrote for, written for us for decades and that we go back to time and again and they know us well and they know their editors well. This art issue uh, this year will have a piece by Ingrid Rowland who of course writes on the Italian Renaissance, that's her subject, and uh, she has written for us for such a long time. She feels like, you know, part of part of the staff without being a staff writer. Uh, so um, there is, you know, there's just obviously when we're constantly pouring over the catalogs, which list what books will be coming out in the new in the coming seasons, and there are titles that stand out as just something obviously right for Ingrid. Rowland. Uh, but then there's other, and you know, so we we know her well. We will send her the book and say, you know, get send us send us your thoughts on this. And uh, as as Ray said, uh, often when you've got someone who's such an expert, they um, the book is an occasion for them to give you their own full thoughts on on a subject that they've sat with for for so long uh, in their career. Um, and then the you know a 60th anniversary year I think is really any anniversary year is really an excellent time to stop and reflect and take stock of what the whole history of the magazine has been and what the next 60 years will be and think you know there's always a tension between stewardship and wanting the magazine to continue to be and do exactly what it has always done and because we all believe in it so well but then also thinking you know who who are the new exciting who are the new Joan Didions who are the new people who are young and can uh and can you know do for us something new and exciting um so there's there's a way in which not having staff writers the staff is constantly reading widely trying to 
uh, kind of scout out, I guess would be the phrase, uh, someone someone new or fresh uh, that we admire. Um, and then if we if we find someone we like, we you know also look in these catalogs, find a book that we would be excited to have covered um, on a topic that you know would we think would interest our readers and be or be the occasion for something. Um, deeper and then you send it send it to that writer and say what, what you know what do you think is this is this something you have ideas about a last question short question maria dagaeta who is one of the main organizers of this encounter this gathering of italian writers here in, in america uh, asked me it's very odd and unusual that a magazine also publishes books you know, and you do this. And Maria Ida was curious to know why and what kind of books you publish and uh, if they are linked or not with the review or if it's a separate thing. Ray might be able to say more about that. Uh, the, the book publishing started, there was a, uh, Jason Epstein, one of the founders of the review, became editor-in-chief of Random House, was an entrepreneur in a wide sense. And he published this catalog called the Reader's Catalog, which was uh, to be the 40,000 best books in print for people who wanted to self-educate. If you wanted to learn about clinical psychology, there would be an expert in that field who would recommend the five to 10 books that you should read if you want to learn ab about that. Between the first and the second edition of the 40,000 best books in like a three-year period, 27,000 of those books went out of print. Uh, the person I was working with as editor of Reader's Catalog, uh, Edwin Frank, and I met and said, we should bring a lot of those books back into print that we like and that we admire and books that we feel are important. And so that's the way that we started publishing. Initially, uh, we licensed major publishers were letting fantastic books go out of print. So we initially we licensed uh, the books that we published from other publishers. Uh, then when electronic books started, publishers began to not allow books to go out of print because they could keep them in print by keeping electronic edition without having print copies. So we changed and now the, the focus is we find some new books but mostly we're publishing books in translation and we have uh, we're bringing a lot of books back uh, else moranti is one of the the latest uh books we've done we, we are we're translating a lot of very large books which which publishers don't like to do but it's something that we feel is important if we like the book we want to do it we're doing a a Danish book next year that's probably 1,100 pages long. So some of these are enormous translation projects, but we feel that they're important. Uh, we have done some books that are collected essays on specific subjects. Uh, we did the, we did a book on the war in Iraq. We did a book on Freud. We did, uh, but those collected essays we're doing much less now than we used to. But it's but it's separate from the magazine. We don't. Uh, it has a separate editor, and he, he selects the books. Thank you. So now uh, we will come back to you in a moment, but now we have here our friend, Professor Massimo Valerio Valerani, who will explain a little bit what is Indice. Here is Indice. This is the last issue. Sadly, we don't have yours to show, but... Uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and so, um, Massimo, if you can explain. Thank you. Thank you to the Institute for this invitation. And I am honored that with, to confront with the uh, New York Review books. Uh, introducing our journal uh, seems an easy task. Uh, it is a review journal that has been enriching Italian culture for 40 years in all fields of knowledge. From the very beginning, the journal uh, has always had a multidimensional vocation open to all disciplines, history, literature, politics, economics, uh, entertainment, cinema, and now also comics and graphic novels, with a twofold purpose.
to broaden the range of specialized readers to other fields, envisioning a kind of Frankensteinian omnivorous reader showing interest in everything. And above all, to show the relationship between disciplines as related to one another and not just coexisting. To take a books as a trace of the dialogue between people and ideas, just like you do, that are constantly changing, and to show also the vital connection between different problems and languages constantly intersecting. So, we are guided by boundless faith in connections, in links running through things, rather than a specialized analysis in things themselves. The approach requires a strenuous exercise in self-discipline, because uh, reviewing a book is both uh, an art and a service, as uh, the founder of Indische, Cesare Casas, the most, most famous Germanist in Italy, said. The art of synthesis, and of course, of training a skill applied to a text, uh, at the same time, is also a service. A service intended for the generalist reader who is not necessarily familiar with the subject matter. So the self-referential enigmatic language of those who are addressed to self-enclosed communities must be avoided. We also ask the reviewers to use their expertise to get out of discipline, not to confine them, but to make the outside world understand why a book is important and why it's important to read it. But if competence and independence of the reviewers are the cardinal virtues, we still need to define the method of work, what a book is and how it can be reviewed. Uh, here I want to present also the columns of the journal. Because designing a journal uh, means determining what a book is, into how many layers it can be divided, uh, what networks of information, emotion, of images it brings into play. So whenever we have to decide the fate of a book, we ask ourselves you know, this question, whose book is, uh, whom is meant to reach, uh, what brought to its writing, what ideas does it gather? I must say that in this, uh, my training as a historian has helped me a great deal because it has provided me with the tools to understand that a cultural artifact, like a book, does not belong only to its author or to his or her background or even to its potential recipients. It belongs to a dynamic context that is formed on a case-by-case -case basis. An important book that has an impact because of its author, of its topics, or the moment, creates its own context. A sociologist would say it belongs to a field, in a Bourdieu sense, which is not just literary or cultural, in the broad sense, but social and political. Here, then, the strategies for placing a book multiply. We have three main ways of dealing with one or more books. Uh, the first, uh, we take the book as a, a work of art, an artifact per se, the expression of a thought on author or on a research. In this case, the one-to-one -one discussion uh, would be offer should offer the first uh, a succinct but effective overview of the content. So a review by an expert is the natural cause of things. Uh, as I say I said earlier uh, here the spirit of service prevails. So you have to synthesize the books and only then add your comment. But if we widen our gaze. We can also start from the theme that the book, or several books, addresses or shells light on. In this case, the scope of the analysis must be broader, the excavation deeper, and even the connection with other books may be necessary. Uh, the book is a part of a network of text to give 
that give meaning, meaning to it. So the column devoted to this insight is called Segnali. There are 10 pages of each issue dedicated to a thing. Uh, it's the longest column of the journal. Uh, and over the years, have defined a space for analysis and also for discovery at the same time. Analysis of movement and themes worthy of more reflective readings and discoveries of lesser known authors of seemingly marginal or contrary emerging cultural context to be explored in depth. Um, for instance, if we go to, through the signali of the last two years, uh, what emerges clearly uh, is a constant thread of attention to non European women's writings and a story from former colonial worlds that have found original form of expression, which interrogate Italian readers, but I think Western readers in general, about the role of literary operation and overall about the political nature of memory shaped by former ruling subjects. Um, our attention to the signal coming from the world of social science is also high, uh, also from problems posed by the new frontiers of eco-crisis or uh, in artificial intelligence is always very high. So to a certain degree, we go with the flow, with the flow, because the Segnali gives an account of the books that come out. But we always try to maintain uh, a transversal perspective in the analysis of books. Uh, we are not uh, a mere reflection, but a crossing of the theme with a critical sounding also provides for internal contradiction and less obvious connection. For example, the case of ecology and also new digital culture, uh, we discover they are often interwined with underlying religious yearnings. So we have to intersect the discipline to understand best the theme that books, one more than books, you know, of, uh, treat. And finally, a third perspective is possible. To start from a problem. Not a theme, but a problem. A problem posed by the book, or by more than one book, when the underlying issue is not clear or straightforward, so the book becomes the telltale of a larger stress field, which must be approached from different perspectives and by different authors. This happened in primo piano, close up. There's a two page of the journal. And the journal most anarchic column where two or more authors approach the book problem from different perspectives, uh, often complicated by the form taken by the problem, not only books, but also a movie, exposition, uh, audiovisual creation. So an intersecting gaze is indeed what we are looking for, because intersection not only multiplies the perspective, but also emerges areas of interference uh, that increase the intensity of the message, like two layers of overla overlapping colors. And we are well aware, thanks to painter Rothko taught us, that overlapping of layers of color is also an act of violence expressing deep disquiet. So, Therefore, it's not coincidence that, going back over the year again, we find many contributions on prisons, migrants, school, neo-fascism, cancel culture, economic crisis, and more open-ended themes, in which tension almost prevails over reflection. So, the research of the different layers of the book is a collective work. Imagine not always a collective operation. Over a year, we engage about 400 reviewers. Um, unlike some major literary supplements, we have not, we have very few field experts hmm, who review all books in that subject area. 
we prefer to rely on a broader pool of reviewers. And I think that this openness is not only a value in itself, but is also a strategic asset of the journal, the economic base that allow us to come out thanks to the work of hundreds of contributors. I think that both authors and readers make an investment in the economic sense. The former provide time and labor, whereas the latter pay a subscription, pay them for the number. But both categories found the journal. And here we come back to the issue of trust, why they work for us why people buy English. Eh? And I think that the real heritage of the, the, the real richness of the journal is its credibility. The credibility that the journal was built with its personal relationship uh, woven over time. Of course, the heritage includes uh, editorial staff you know, and managing staff. But what is the future? Few, few, few words about the future. I will brief here because I don't need to convince anyone that interaction, the form of interaction, counter interaction has changed and that the flow of information, including those books, greatly expanded the audience of readers, authors, and even reviewers. There are a lot of reviewers online and, and uh, out to product site, uh, into the site. So, for years, we have been confronted with this fluidized reality which has dissolved everything into a very fast current of books, reviews, commercial, interviews, and so on. So we can ask ourselves why the industry still survives to this and uh, how can we should survive? Uh, well, I know the answer, the final, the real answer. Uh, I think that the print issues with all its problems, must continue to exist. And the second, I think that the Indische has not so many economic results, but he had the archive. He has the, his archive. The archive of Indische, I think they still represent the major capital of the journal. And the question is, uh, what relationship do we want to have with the bottom-up access to digital media and content? So we are digitized in our archive, but what do we do with this archive hmm, online? Should the industry become a large supermarket hmm, where we fish for things, or remain a place for proposal, pointing new direction for development of a serious, meaningful connection we believe that the second, the second choice, the second option would be more faithful, fruitful and compatible with the history of the journal. Not in the sense of governing the flow from above, but I think to feed the flow, if we stick with the liquid metaphor, by bringing our own content, increasing the scope of ideas, and of course, responding to the reader's question. Hence, the course will be try to push us is to imagine some products by this archive. What we can do with this archive, what we can give, we can give to the readers. And I imagine, but I'm still working about it, uh, three types of utilization of archives. Um, a little series of monographic special issues, I can call uh, Campo Lungo, the long shot, on a particular topic addressed by journal in previous issues. So we could also go for long time spans, 10 years, 20 years, proposing patterns of analysis with different degrees of in-depthness to be sold on the web website in, or in print. So 20 years of history, 20 years of literature, of English or Italian and so on. Then we can talk about um, a single book uh, review, l'indice del libro, it means the change, uh, to change the access reviews that have been previously published on a single author or topics, just you doing now. Uh, 
And the third, the last, is Intrecci, propose uh, reading perspective where connections are strongest and reading different books proves most fruitful. It means that we have to intersect different themes and different problems, proposing our choice hmm, of this, uh, the reviews about this theme. So this is what we are doing and uh, we want to exist <laughs> still in the future. Before giving, um, before giving the floor to you and to ask the questions you want, um, it would be interesting to know if I am right for Italy, I'm right for America, that uh, newspapers are selling less and less. Uh, you know, people read less and less newspapers and also reviews books or other things are less, obviously less and less important for uh, the life of the book, of the film, or whatever, right? Because once upon a time, a review was very, very important for a writer, you know, if they had a bad review, the book was dead, a good review, the book could flourish. But what is interesting, at least in Italy, and I hope it's the same in America, is that bookstores are coming back. And books sell almost as well as they did before. In st on the country, newspapers do not sell as they sold before. So you are in, in the middle, because you are a, a kind of a review, a newspaper, a magazine, right? Reviews are less and less important. Uh, but books are there. People, young people, old people read books. And in the universities, students prefer to read books, physical books, than reading, uh, you know, online or whatever. And uh, also, this is what in the university I am doing and many other people do, is fighting about keeping on writing. And this is also, there's a famous critic called Hans Ulrich uh, Obrist, who is fighting with me about the fact that we should not left pen and paper, right, for writing. I mean, to keep on writing. Because writing is also a calligraphy. Calligraphy changes over the years for writers. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you want to study uh, who is a writer, you know, it's better if he keeps on having his own calligraphy. Um, so all these are things that we have seen and perceived. It's not a real question. You know, a question could be how many copies you sell of your magazine, how many copies you sell of your magazine, who are your readers, who are your readers. But Mostly, how do you face this? The fact that the book is still there, newspapers are less important, critics are less important, but uh, uh, people like to read books, and young people too, and real books. So can you answer to this subject before we ask public questions? <coughs> we have... We have um, about 135,000 circulation, of which 120,000 are print copies. Our renewal rate is 86%, which means most of the people who subscribe to the review continue to review, continue to renew, and, and continue to read it. And I think the reason that people are continuing to read <coughs> the review is because it's not just a straight book review. It's 4,000 words. It, it educates people on subjects that they care about. We have um, very distinct categories, as I mentioned before, politics, science, art, so on. And every issue has at least one article in those categories. And I think we don't expect people to read the entire issue, but people read from it what they want to read. And we're continuing to see people do that. 
our circulation is growing faster in digital subscribers than it is in print subscribers, but uh, I think print is very important to us, and as long as we can can keep it, we we will. And so far, we see no signs of of getting rid of it whatsoever. We do see book people reading more books again, which you're exactly right. Ebook sales are down with all publishers. Uh, print books are up. It's a dichotomy that uh, I, I can't explain it, but I'm. It's a happy problem to have. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I add to this that in Italy we translate many, many foreign books. In the United States, I think you are a little bit of an exception. There are much less foreign books translated. Whenever I'm outside of America, it's the great translation problem. You know, why aren't you translating more books from our language? And go to India, and you'll here, <laughs> what is it, 27, 29 languages, and everybody wants their language translated into English. It's, um, it's a great problem, and it's, it's one we are, with our own books, uh, you know, as I say, mostly translations now. We're trying to, to find books from foreign languages. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was just having a coffee with a writer who was talking to me about Francesca Melandri. Am I saying that right? Yeah. And uh, how he had read a book of hers in Italian and wanted to write about it for us, but it's not in English. And he won't, you know, can he do that? And anyway, um, just one, one example of how we should have more and more books translated into English for, for American readers. Um, but I think it was uh, Fran Leibowitz said the one thing that gives her hope is on the subway, all the people not looking at their phones but reading physical books are young people. So young people are reading um, to just to respond a little bit to one thing you said uh, and to continue to answer your question about how we think about assigning reviews. Uh, I think one of the things that we're proud of is a uh, kind of disregard for timeliness uh, in in the books that we, you know, we're, we're not keeping up with the publicity or press cycle of a new book with the week it comes out. Often that's when all of the reviews run, but we really want to kind of spend time to give it a kind of a long, cold take, uh, a long, considered, uh, deep uh, consideration of a book. And if that takes you know, if that's going to take us past the publication dates, all right for readers to be reminded of a book again uh, after it's come out. So, um, so you know, that's that's one thing that we keep in mind when we're having editorial discussions. Before I ask the same question to him, I want to mention something which distinguishes you very much, and that I was very impressed by. I had the pleasure and the, uh, the honor to interview not many years ago Robert Silvers before he died. And his passion for the métier, he called it métier, which is job, work, I don't know, of editing, you know, was amazing in his precision. And, uh, and when I, we interviewed him, he was calling at two in the morning and saying, you know, I'm sorry, but maybe in this sentence I would put a semicolon there if you don't mind. And then he would call again the next day and said, you know, I changed my mind. Maybe it's not necessary to put the semicolon. You know, he was so incredibly devoted and precise to his job, even sleeping in the news in in the in the office at night, right? So I don't know if nowadays there are editors like that, I hope you are, but it, it left. But uh, I mean, he was a great lesson. And probably one of the reasons why the newspapers, at least in Italy, are not so well followed is because the métier, you know, of editing and also in the book publishing houses has been neglected, right? And uh, uh, so I think uh, Bob was a great maestro, and I'm glad to say it here today. And I hope this tradition is kept. I'm sure it is. Thank you. Sorry for the parentheses. Um, I think that, um, I'm, I am less optimistic than you about the young and the reader <laughs> and the books. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> yes, there's a, a very young, but not so young as my students, my pupils in university. And 
I think that uh, I do believe that the book remains, uh, but certainly it will be partly different from what we know now. Um, writing is undergoing uh, a process of uh, simplification uh, never seen before. Um, I think that the invention of print press in the 16th century uh, marked a process. Uh, the spread of a written language uh, completely different from oral one. Now, the opposite is happening. Um, we are entering in a new form of mass orality. And I think that everyone who knows some school teachers uh, knows very well that our students uh, in the college or also university, uh, they can less and less not only read but also write the same language in the same handwriting of their parents. It's changing the grammatical and also the calligraphy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with the books still <laughs> live, uh, our little review, uh, journal review, maybe survive, but we have been uh, well aware that the book will be something different. The language will be something different. So a little part of the book production will be the same, just like in this, you know, in this hall. But outside this hall, the language, the capacity of readings, uh, the writings, uh, the form of communication is, I would say, overwhelming novelty that we have, we have, we have to know that it is. There will be some difference, so we have to prepare to a uh, new generation of books, completely different from this one. Uh, I think that, from a little little position of English, <laughs> evidently, that uh, one task that we have to to do is insist in connection. So to show um, how all the knowledge that the books uh, contain uh, are, are connected. So we have a little guide to the interconnection of knowledge that the books are treating about. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, a solution. Not to still, uh, it's true that in Italy, uh, in Italy, journals are in an uh, enormous crisis. The newspaper uh, they lost, uh, they lost uh, thousand, thousand of readers, thousand of readers, hundred by hundred. Yes, in complex, but the the, the 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 newspaper that I know, they lost ten, twenty thousand readers uh, per year. So. It's really an enormous crisis. We are <laughs> the Indische still survive because you know, the number are so much lesser. But the problem exists. But the problem is broader. The problem is that writing is changing. I think. Uh, Valéry Larbeau, a famous French writer and translator and critic, said in each country there are 1,500 very good readers. And that's quite enough. You know, he said. <laughs> so uh, we may be optimistic. Now, is there any one of you who would like to ask a question? There is someone there who wants to ask a question. Hi. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I was. I was. I, before I wanted to ask more about a point that Lauren, you were bringing up about uh, one thing that I think is very special about the New York Review books, of course, is the fact that you don't just have reviews uh, pub week for a book. And it was something I was talking about. I'm a, a literary translator. I also worked in Italy as an editor, and I can say that in Italy, too, it's very rare to have something like that. Um, so I was talking about this with a reviewer recently, the, the lack of reviews after um, uh, uh, pub day or pub week, etc., and how that effect is for most readers. There's a kind of oversaturation that doesn't arrive at the reader uh, unless it's an author who's already greatly anticipated. 
Whereas um, the, when people slowly build interest in a book, that's when reviews cease to come out. Whereas, so I was curious in, in the case of the review, you know, sometimes it comes almost on the crest of a wave, you know, but people build interest in this book, in this author, sometimes it's a series of books, and that's when, you know, magically, when no one else is writing about it, the New York Review books will have a great piece on it. So sometimes it's, I was wondering how much it's, um, you know, a happy accident, or how much it again is, you know, um, or if it's intentional, or if it's again, just the nature of giving people more space and more time, which of course necessitates, uh, you know, more time for them to work on the piece. So coming out later, yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah, um, I think, well, uh, a couple of things I think of uh, in response to what you said. Um, the first being that um, what goes back to kind of our founding our founding moment uh, and Elizabeth Hardwick's uh, about on the decline of book reviewing. Um, it was the same the same dichotomy she was pointing out then exists now that there's that there are short little pieces of writing um, that uh, leave a reader wanting more and there should be an uh, alternative for a reader um, today. Now we might think of it. And there is a place for this, and it's good, but kind of snackable content, short little pieces. Um, and the review offers something much different. Uh, I think to the to the question, um, you know, as the managing editor, I should I shouldn't admit that uh, you know this, these things might be slightly random uh, because I'm meant to be you know keeping schedules and deadlines and things. But I think there is a way in which having our we we invest so much in our writers and we trust them so much, and they, we are really like, I mean, all magazines are writer forward, writer interested, but I think us especially. Um, and so to answer maybe just, you know, I'm, just, I'm picking up on one thing you've said, which is, you know, a, a book that, or a, an author that other people have, hasn't been getting attention, but maybe among a small, a lar an increasingly large group of serious readers, they're wondering about, you know, they're, they've kind of been reading her and then all of a sudden the New York Review might publish a piece that is a review of one of those books that hasn't been getting the big publicity push. Um, I think it's just it's just trust in our writers that they are, you know, they're they're the most knowledgeable about the things they know and they are the ones who can, you know, who will file a piece uh, and and take us to, you know, take us to a reader that we, or an author that, you um, our readers should know about uh and um and also the the fact of the matter is that often if a writer wants to take a great deal of time on a piece that is what we want we want we know we don't want to rush them to meet a deadline simply to get a piece to press uh we want them to have the time and space to to think um so i think that answers at least part of your question okay Can I, uh, and, uh, oh, just it's not unusual for one of our writers when he's given a book to review to go back and read the entire work of the writer that's under review and that takes time so when they get the book they go back and read everything else they, they're not going to be able to have a review the next week other questions Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Ariana Farinelli, and I'm an Italian uh, writer who lives here in New York City. I have a question for the review and a question for Lindice. First of all, for the review, thank you for existing, <laughs> because you really make a, a great difference for writers and readers alike. And I remember 10 years ago uh, watching the documentary by uh, Martin Scorsese, on the review at Lincoln Center and stay for the question and answer. It was wonderful to understand the history of the review. And also thank you for uh, translating and writing reviews of books on translation, which is so important for us foreign writers. Um, so I would like to ask you, what is your philosophy behind uh, publishing and reviewing books translated in translation? Uh, by foreign authors, um, and why do you think instead the rest of the publishers ignore foreign authors so much? Because in this market, less than 2% of the books 
they are published are published in translation. And then for Lindice, I would like to ask you, you know, Italy is a country that reads very, very little, um, and in which young people read very, very little, especially in comparison to other countries like, for example, Germany. And uh, um, in front of that, we have to, a market that produces 80,000 titles, 80,000 books every year. So I was wondering if you have any idea on how we can keep young readers interested. Uh, we were, as when we were young, we were certainly re uh, big readers, strong readers. Uh, but now, you know, young people are very distracted by m many other things, especially social media, while we were very, very bored uh, young people because there was not much to do. So, you know, reading was also a way not to be bored, especially if, like me, you were coming from a poor neighborhood where there was not much to do. So books were a way to travel when you couldn't travel, a way to dream when, you know, the reality around you didn't allow to dream so much. So thank you both. Thank you. I, uh, as, as Ray said, the, the book publishing, the New York Review book publishing and the New York Review, the magazine are separate. So I'll speak just briefly to reviewing works in translation, which uh, I think one uh, thing in particular personally that I find important when doing that and want to always in, kind of uh, bring out is um, the quality of the translation itself. I think so few book reviewers happen to read the same language of the book and translation that they're reviewing. And you can't find someone who has, who's bilingual and knows the author and all that every time. But if you can find someone who can understand the original language and speak at least for a part of the review about the quality of the, that, of the, you know, translation itself, how it compares to the original, how it might hold up or not hold up. I think that's always important to include uh, at, in, a, in a review of a work in translation. Uh, a difficult question because um, I have, I, I love to avoid the moment in which I say, when I was young, the world is better. So <laughs> my effort is just to not condemn uh, this new generation, that's my son generation, my daughter generation, and to understand what is happening. So I don't think that they read less than, they read everything, they, uh, other things. They do something different. But they read, they are always with, you know, they sell <laughs> behind the eyes. So I think that uh, we must understand, uh, and it's not easy because we have no uh, tools to understand, but we must understand uh, which uh, kind of communication, this flow of images, uh, message, uh, and so on, um, not signify, but uh, what it represent for them. Because they uh, are building their world, the interior world, in a totally different way. No? You say, we bore it and then <laughs> we read. It's true, reading is not more... After 10 years in Italy, nobody reads other books. Hmm? Uh, uh, Harry Potter and then stop. Seven volumes of Harry Potter and then it's very difficult uh, to make a, a, a young a young boy or young girl uh, read a book. But they uh, passed a lot of time with the older system of communication uh, that is not, uh, I thought about orality, but it's not orality, but it's also imaging. So these, uh, they have really different minds. Mm? We have to understand. We have to understand what to do with these different minds, with this uh, different mind built with different system and uh, with different languages. Um, uh, I have a nightmare no, that uh, the, the, the best song that I heard when I was young was the times they are changing. Now I am in the wrong side of the river. No? So <laughs> we have to understand how the flow is coming and how to enter in contact with this flow without condemning it. I refuse because I'm teaching. So the, the, the worst thing that you can do with uh, the students is to say, oh boy, you are a no, you read nothing, you are different, you are ignorant, uh, because they are not ignorant. They know 
very a lot of things different from the, the things that we know. But the, just the difference, we have to study the difference. And I think that we, we have to work with the difference, not to separate. It's not an answer, but I don't, I don't have any. It is method. an answer. Do we have any other question? Do we have time for one more question? Great. Um, thank you. So I think we heard a lot of great things about your writers and the ways in which you engage your writers, uh, and I'm curious to hear more about your readers, both in terms of, kind of your actual readers, uh, the the kind of people that read you, right? Because obviously we all read you and it's our job to read and to write, so no surprise there. But who else uh, is reading the New York Review books? Lin Dishe, both in terms of, uh, we talked a lot about young and older people, so demographics, uh, but also kind of socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, um, who are the people who are not professional um, writers or readers that are engaging with, uh, with your work? Um, part of the reason why I'm asking that question is because I have the feeling just anecdotally that um, here in the US uh, there is a much larger portion of uh, people who are just, you know, your, your lawyer, your professional that reads uh, things like the New York Review of Books that in Italy that kind of group of people has shrunk greatly over the past few years. So yeah, just curious to hear more about your readers, your imagined audience, um, who do you address and who actually reads you? Oh, does this one work? <clears throat> our, our readers are, the largest group of readers are in the New York City metropolitan area, second largest San Francisco Bay Area and then after that, Boston, then Chicago. So it's pretty much a um, uh, what used to be a national magazine pattern. Uh, of the 135,000 uh, subscribers that we have, about 20,000 are in the UK. Um, and then we have about 15,000 in Europe. Mostly they're professionals, uh, but that doesn't mean all academics. There's a lot of... Uh, people in finance, who, <laughs> oddly enough, who, who read the review. Um, and they're, with the digital editions, they're younger people, as you would expect to do it. There are a lot of, uh, of uh, kids going to, to university that, that read us. There's a, a good group of people from a variety of uh, universities where we have it. So it's a our print readers are older, digital or younger, um, but they've always been older. I keep thinking, you know, if they keep following my age, pretty soon we're all going to be dead, and then, and then who's going to read the review? But it continues to just stay older readers, and it just, the average age just stays the same year after year. But uh, Indische has an original scene is born in academic, so in the university in Turin. So, of course, a lot of our readers uh, came from university or university uh, degree uh, of culture. So, and this is the core of readers. Uh, it's a core of readers that is older and older. That's, that's clear. So, we have to uh, enter in contact with the new generation. And it is not easy for the reason that I said. Because the students at university are very different uh, from our, and so it, it, this is just an elite. Mm? But this is very elite, it as much difficult to concentrate to read a book. I think that is difficult, more difficult to read a review of our other books. So <laughs> the English is it needs a literacy of the second level people who read books and then is interesting in the review of books. There are fewer and fewer, these people. So we have to uh, invent, we have to imagine, uh, and the, the task that I take with the industry is to imagine something that um, make the review of books uh, not just, um, how you say, uh, a gift for yet gifted people, but something that a bridge of idea with people that 
has some difficult to read the books, but uh, can read something about the book without feeling himself not at level, hmm? feeling himself like uh, people that can understand what the book is saying. So, this, uh, I think that is a moment really difficult to for the industry because it's an academic origin, very high, very specialized. Uh, um, core of readers, very specialized, very cultivated, but also old. And a new public that has different kind of uh, cultural formation and also minded, different minded, and with which we had to uh, go towards, but with different tools. Mm, we have to um, imagine something, not a review, but a discourse, uh, a dialogue about the problem, and show this reader, this new reader, how books may help them to understand their problem. Hmm? I think that we, we have to do this. Thank you. I mean, are there any other questions? Maybe a last question, or shall we conclude here? Someone wants to ask a question? So, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. We learned what happened a little bit what happens in America and what happens in Italy. And I would resume if I understood anything that our friend of the Indice, um, I don't know if he's more pessimistic or he <laughs> is more optimistic, you know, I, because he's talked a lot about that we should change and find new ways and uh, instead. I felt that the American New York Review books are more confident in without, they don't, I mean, if I understood anything, they, they don't want to change too much. In other words, just to make a metaphor, um, I believe that they still believe that uh, uh, in French it's called Le Petit Prince, no, the small prince, I don't know what is the English title, Piccolo Principe, who is probably one of the most read books in the world, will still be read uh, uh, by the new generations and other generations. In other words, probably storytelling, fables, children's stories um, will always be a necessity uh, for the young generations. And I also believe that you know, we always said it was different before, right? It was better before. It was, uh, but that's a bad sign. So, in conclusion, you are right to look forward to new possibilities of writing. But I don't think that writers should follow too much that, you know, you do run after possible new readers. Otherwise, you lose. Yeah, you know, what you have to say. I think a writer should be mainly free. You both very free to publish whatever you want, uh, to talk about the issues or the subjects that you want in the way you want. If you are against the war of Vietnam, you are against. If you are against this, you are against. You know, and this is what is important, to keep the freedom of expression of us or writers, or professors, or journalists, or whatever we are. So, thank you very much for being here t this morning, and uh, good luck for the books, <laughs> and for the release. Thank you. Thank you.